Good evening, and thank you again for joining us on the Old Ways Podcast. My name is Michael Diamond, and I am pleased to bring you back to the interview series. So in 2023, the Old Ways Podcast is doing a creator interview series. We speak to creators and people within the gaming community who have a special voice. And tonight, we're going to be speaking with Charles Ryan of Monty Cook Games. And so, without any further ado, what I'd like to do is let you introduce yourself writ large, sort of the present day. Mm-hmm. And then I have a, um, a list, a very small list promise of questions that hopefully we can extract some interesting factoids from. Cool, cool. Yeah, so I am uh, the CEO and one of the partners at Monty Cook Games. Um, Monty Cook Games has been around for 10 years. It was our 10th anniversary this year. So we're very, very pleased and proud of that. At Monty Cook Games, I do some of the business management, although that's largely with Tammy Ryan. I do most of the marketing and that that's runs from the high level stuff all the way down to sort of, you know, like actually building out the next Kickstarter or writing the copy that goes on the back of the books. Um, most of that, some of that's going to move over to a, to a new person soon or yes, yeah, so right about mid-March, we expect to be, uh, to be um, welcoming somebody else into our fold. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I've come, come to this job having been in the industry for 30 or so years. I started out as an indie publisher myself back before indie was really a thing or what we think of now as indie was really a thing. I did that for a number of years. I uh, uh, love that. Uh, I worked at Last Unicorn Games when we did the Star Trek games and a, a Dune, the first Dune role-playing game. And I did a lot of stuff in that. I wore a lot of hats in, the, in, those, uh, in, in, in that realm. Last Unicorn was purchased by Wizards of the Coast, so I worked there for a number of years. And I was uh, in the R&D side for uh, the bulk of that for like four years, I think. And uh, did editing, design, development, and ultimately went over to, be, to brand management, where I was the brand manager for D&D for a couple of years. And then I had this really awesome opportunity to go overseas and work as the mar- uh, marketing manager for a whole bunch of brands, uh, Dungeons & Dragons, um, Pokemon, uh, a whole lot of uh, board game brands and whatnot. When I was working for a company that was called Isdevium at the time, um, ultimately purchased by Asmodee, so now it's known as Asmodee UK. Mm, okay. And then that ultimately sort of led around from there to here. Yeah. So I, I think <clears throat> given your position and how I have come to know you th- through not just Monty Cook Games, but obviously previous stuff that you've worked on, uh, mm-hmm. uh, we, we played a ton of Star Trek, uh, Last Unicorn Star Trek uh, back in the day. And I think that a lot of people would know you through the, the, the imprints that you've had your hands on rather than maybe know you directly. Seems reasonable. But I think the compelling question I have at the start for me is, when did playing games go from being a hobby to going to what you what you do for a career, right? Not just the, the side money, the mm-hmm. independent money is, is now now I'm I'm going to have a career in this field. Pretty much right away when I went in, into design work, but that's kind of a kind of coincidental. I, I probably like most people of my generation, you know, we started off in first edition D and D. First edition D and D was a game that invited a lot of tinkering because it frankly, didn't work in a lot of ways uh, to do much more than what it sort of did at its, at its core. So I think probably almost everybody kit bashed uh, D&D to a certain extent. And I, I did, a, did a whole lot of that. Um, I knew a couple of people that had gone into public self designing their own uh, role playing games and publishing them. Um, so like Greg Porter was sort of, a, I wasn't close with Greg, but like Greg was like a friend of my roommate, like, they're like sort of at the like we didn't overlap. We, it was this is when I was in university at uh, Virginia Tech. We didn't really overlap very much, but I knew lots of the same people, and so I had a couple of sort of uh, people who showed me in the late '80s that you could actually do this. Because in the '80s, we did like the, when I first started, it was right at the dawn of desktop publishing, and uh, that, that was literally about the time that I was sitting down at a keyboard to write something. It was about the time when it was actually possible for a human who wasn't a, a big publishing company to publish something. So having that, uh, the people who were in front of me, uh, seeing that they were able to succeed at that, I thought that was, that was really cool. And I, and I began to pursue the idea of doing my own game. I wasn't thinking about doing it professionally. I was working, uh, I took a couple of years off from college and I worked in uh, land planning, in, in civil engineering. Okay. And I'm um, like laying out strip malls and things like that uh, and doing this on the side. And it was uh, uh, 1990, and there was a pretty big real estate market crash in the Washington, D.C. area. And all the land planning companies laid, laid everybody off. And so I was not just laid off, but I was also like no prospect of getting another job because every place that I would might call for another job was was closed up. So um, 
I decided to go back. That was a great time to switch back to going, returning to school. And while I was doing it, I was like, I'm going to publish this stuff I've been working on. And I don't have a job. So it became my job. And then, you know, it was doing okay. So I, I did it full time. A real rarity in the industry. It's way, I wouldn't say way easier, but it is definitely the prospects of it doing it in today's market versus the market in the late night early 90s to 90s is a lot different. Very much so. We, you know, the, the single biggest thing, well, there's, there's two big factors. One is the technology change that allowed and enabled desktop publishing. Um, and that went very rapidly. Like I said, when I was laying out my first book in, well, so I was doing it in the very, very beginning of 1991, 19, late 19 and into 1991, because I was just been laid off and I watched the Gulf War on TV, on CNN, while I worked on my layout. <laughs> so um, I can, I can place place that very distinctly in time. So the technology shift between them then, where in my first books, I was still getting artwork photographically screened and stripped in, um, really only laying out text or in a, excuse me, a desktop publishing uh, piece of software through the nineties, you know, at which point you get to this practically, you know, hitting print and sending it off to a service bureau and getting it printed. That technology shift was, was enormous and enabled an awful lot more uh, capabilities of people getting into the into the industry themselves, um, and then of course in the last decade or so, um, Kickstarter and crowdfunding has just enormously transformed that capability. Well, I think it's a it's a pathway um, I've seen at least with a ton of MCG products that are you know not but five or so feet away from me now on my bookshelf. <laughs> Most of them have been delivered to me in some form or another through crowdfunding, mm-hmm. right? So I think there's a huge empowerment that's been given uh, to the players and the game masters in the uh, that that fill the tables mm-hmm. to say this is what we want to play and it's i think i remember the i remember the first kickstarter for for numenera and and all the st- stuff that went along with it just feeling like a tidal wave had broke right when some, when some of those started to happen right. and then it was just there's another one and then there's another one and and so i i think that for our audience that's going to listen to this Monty Cook Games at large is, is a name people know because of, you know, all of Monty's work from D&D mm-hmm. past, right? right? But in the past 10 years, again, it's the 10-year anniversary of Monty Cook Games, there's been a lot of new road that has been put out by him and by the entire cast therein of uh, of Monty Cook at large, wouldn't you say? Yeah, you know, I mean, for sure. Like, And, you know, we do a lot of crowdfunding. Because not just because it's a way to raise money, but also because it's a way to reach audiences. You know, the the traditional three tier, like you you make a book, you sell it to a distributor, the distributor sells it to a hobby store before it goes to the consumer. That has an enormous number of gateways, and particularly there's there's so much good stuff in our hobby. Um, and when you look at, at at board games, you're talking about as much stuff coming out in a month as used to come out in a year, and so much of it is good, really good stuff. It's right. just that, so that channel can only absorb so much. Um, so it's a great way to reach your audience as well as to to you know remain cash flow positive as you go through a process that involves spending a lot of money up front. And so that really does let you experiment too. That's the other the other great thing about it is you can do a thing that's risky that um, you know you you wouldn't be able to take that chance if you were going to th- put it out there into uh, into a, a, the, the conventional tier. And partly partly that's because of discounts, right? So if you're going to make a thing. It's really, really cool, and you're going to charge $100 for it. You only get 35 or 40 bucks of that when it goes into distribution. So that puts some limitations on it. But then again, you know, like when you look at something uh, like Invisible Sun is a great example, but also really almost any any sort of deluxe product, those would just be way too too risky. And I'm not talking just about ours. I'm talking about all the cool stuff you see out there on, on Kickstarter and in crowdfunding in general. You know, people that are making. Um, uh, versions of products that are uh, far more interesting than the realities of conventional uh, methods to bring things to market would normally allow. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's, I can think of a few um, early Kickstarter projects where, not from obviously not from from you mm-hmm. or Monty Cook Games, but I can remember some of the pitfalls of some of the ultra deluxe things that were offered, and then the people finally realized what international shipping costs were right. and it was like oh, oh wait how do we ship this product yeah. uh to australia and it costs what and how many people purchased this oh no i know a, um it's actually a board game publisher but there's somebody that, that i know where they 
they, they produce really high end, large games. And they had, you know, something that they did a, a, a million dollar Kickstarter on, you know, that did a great game. Everything about it was wonderful. But then we had this freight crisis that we had last year where freight, freight went up enormously in cost. And they, you know, they had it like a 250 or $280,000 increase like above their budget for the cost of that freight and you know that a million dollars sounds like a great kickstarter but a quarter of a million dollars going into, into that into unexpected freight costs is is just insane you've been a part of some pretty amazing kickstarters as far as totals go um thank i you. know i helped but <laughs> <laughs> well thank you i i think that the allure therein is that especially when a lot of them are grounded around the cipher system and people understand what they're going to get in that, I think the buy-in for fans is easy. For, for our audience who maybe has not played mm -hmm. a, enough or any Cypher system, can you give, give me a generalized breakdown or give them a generalized breakdown of what the system truly is tailored to do? You know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to go over here. I'm going to open my web browser off to the side. And I'm going to look at the text that I'm currently writing for a crowdfunding campaign that will be over by the time that people uh, listen to this. So the Cypher system is an RPG that is a, is a generic or multi-system RPG. You can use it to run anything you like. And that's really what we love to say about it. It's, it's any, any campaign, any world, any genre, the Cypher system makes it really easy. It's very, very easy uh, on the GM in the sense that um, the GM doesn't roll the dice. The GM's not doing math at the table. The GM's not figuring out difficult rules at the table. All of that, as much stuff, as much of the work as possible is pushed out onto the players. So it distributes the workload a little bit and keeps the GM focused on making things fun and cool. But when I look over here at my draft copy of the of the um, campaign that I'm that I'm building right now, like so, here are the sec the section is literally called "Why this will be your new favorite RPG." So you can see why it's timely for your question. So you make a character with a three part sentence: uh, a rugged warrior who stands like a bastion, or uh, a, a charming speaker who bears a head of a fire, or a graceful explorer who moves like the wind. And all those three parts, the a blank blank who blanks each one of those brings something uh to your character mechanically so you start with a narrative concept and build it into a mechanically uh, uh sound uh, uh character second reason it is just so easy to run um everything the gm does is on a scale of one to ten so how hard is that on a scale of one to ten if you can imagine how hard something is on a scale of one to ten you can run the cypher system you can run any encounter on the fly you can make stuff up that's all you got to be able to do there's Obviously, a lot of mechanics that, that hang off of that that allow you to do more to it than that. But that is the, the basic. It's, it is super, super easy on the gym. It's also really easy to prep for, right? Again, same thing. Same thing uh, is there. Your imagination is really freed up to uh, to make the game cool and interesting. I used to run a ran many, many third edition games when I was the brand manager for D and D, and I apps and and any for years afterwards. Absolutely, absolutely loved that game system, but spend an hour thinking of what the night's adventure is going to be and two hours writing stat blocks. And here you spend an hour thinking of what the night's adventure is going to be. And then you have some spare time. So you spend another hour thinking about how really cool it's going to be. And then you spend 10 minutes making stat blocks. Right. I think the, the point I drove home to some of my first players way back when with, with Numenera was the game master, the storyteller, whatever you want to call it, it's a non-adversarial role. Right. And so I, I took away from that showing them, listen, we could we could play D and D sure, and there's going to be um, a GM screen. I'm going to roll dice behind it. The difference is with the cipher system, I I never used, I never needed. I mean, yes, the GM screen is there for reference, but mm -hmm. it, it's an open table, and the the give and take between the narrative control of the story, I think, is what so many people. It's so interesting too because so many of those games popped up three or four years after. Right. That Numenera Kickstarter. And I was like, it's it's not the system per se. What it is people are getting to is we can share the narrative. It's okay. Right. It doesn't mean that, you know, there isn't a game master, isn't some uh, who's a main storyteller. You're not giving that up. You're sharing it with them. And that in, enriches the total experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's one thing that the Cypher system drives home pretty well. Yeah. And you've actually sort of made my next point for me because that... Uh, it's not just that that exists in the Cypher system, but there's built-in tools. You know, the GM intrusion, the player intrusion, the way player use, make players use XP, for example, things like that. There are all these elements built in to do exactly what, what you just described. Um, it's also fast-paced and, and, and fun to play. 
um, you will probably play twice as many encounters in Ignite session as you play in that in, in the game that you're playing now, just because they will go quickly. They'll be they will be high energy, high speed, but all those like you know whatever forty five second or ninety second periods between actions when people are working out mechanics, those that all gets stripped away, and it's just the one thing happens after the other. Yeah, surprisingly so. So, speaking of Monty Cook games, how's it changed in 10 years? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, you know, I don't want to put words in anybody else's mouth, but I think that when Monty and Shauna, who founded the company, ran that first Numenera Kickstarter that you mentioned, they were just, you know, they were independent creators who had this great idea that they wanted to bring to life. And I don't think that they had in mind to, to build a big company, but that Kickstarter did really well and it generated a whole bunch of different books and they hired, um, they needed help. Like after six months in, they're like, you know what? We just need some more than just the two of us doing this. And they hired Tammy first, uh, part-time. She was the first employee. Um, I, I came on second. Uh, and uh, then, you know, by the time the first year or so was out, probably more than a little bit more than that, but uh, we had Bruce on and, and Bear. And so we have uh, about a dozen um, we have our uh, little warehouse that we ship out of. Um, we have some, we call them team labor, labor force. We have a, a, a nice uh, group of kids that uh, come in in the afternoons and uh, uh, ship out all your packages and, and whatnot. And they do a great job. Uh, I would say the biggest thing, that the biggest change is is the people that we've got down with a dozen people. Now, that said, we're small. We like being small. We don't have aspirations of becoming some big company in a big glass building. Nobody wants that. Um, um, we kind of love where it is and, um, we still are very, very focused on making the games that we want made and that we want to play. So we never sit down and say, you know, well, what new books can we make for Numenera? Because Numenera hasn't had some new books. So, you know, how do we think up some new things that people might buy? It's everything is driven by the vision of the designers, uh, um, to, to make the games they want to make. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's so very much different than what, um, Many of us might be used to a development team that sits around a conference table and says, okay, by Q2, we need to have X, Y, and Z product. And then I need you to look forward to, you know, this portion mm -hmm. of the year where it feels like there's a, a constant steady drumbeat because the products, I mean, the products must be made. And I, I mm -hmm. can't tell you how many second and third edition books that just, I mean, I, I use, I use D and D as an example because it is the most relevant example of the time period, but mm -hmm. they just come out with books. They, oh, here's, I, here, just here's another book. Yeah. And uh, it seems to be like so, sort of a, a self-fulfilling thing. And I, I think that our last interviewee, Matthew Dawkins, raised a great point, which is that some of the community uh, creations are actually, f I mean, in, much better than what they're seeing come out of the, the actual brand house. And I think that that right. is telling. Um, so I, th I think that is mostly true in in a lot of the community. Some some communities excluded, of course, but I think a lot of them are seeing a, that ability for whether it be the Storytellers Vault or DMs Guild or whether it be the Miskatonic mm -hmm. Repository for Chaosium. Mm -hmm. You're really seeing some content creators get out there and say, oh, okay, well, I can just make it on my own. And so mm -hmm. I will. Right. Um, so uh, so that's been, it's been a good time uh, seeing that stuff come out um, and not having to necessarily go and pray at the altar of, you know, uh, Wizards of the Coast and hope that your product comes out. You know, even even setting aside whether or not some companies sort of become mills for their product or whatnot, which which isn't really what, what I'm going after, but even, even setting that aside, the mere fact of opening something up and sort of saying to an entire world of people who are using their imagination in the space of your game on a daily or weekly basis to, you know, come up with ideas, come up with cool stuff that we might not just never have come up with or just don't have time to put on our schedule or what have you. You're, you're going to get great things. And and so all those programs that you mentioned, I think, are, are examples of how the, you know, the game can benefit from, you know, from everybody's mind coming in and, and, and everybody's creativity. And you'll, you'll get some dross for sure. You'll get maybe get a lot of dross, but you also get so you'll get some gold and some diamonds in there. And we just this past year opened up the Cypher System, um, uh, Cypher System Open License, which uh, basically lets people do what they want in the Cypher System. And some pretty cool things are in the pipeline uh, as a result of that, small and big. So we're excited about that. Oh, good. Good. No, that's fantastic. It'd be uh, fun to see the... I know that the the community, the Cypher community, 
is a very passionate fan base. Um, I won't call them rabid <laughs> out of respect. And I, I conclude myself as a fan of the setting, uh, various settings and the system, uh, if only because I, I think that it's an amazing potential tool for storytelling. And that's what mm-hmm. I'm after, right? Is great right. stories. Uh, and so I think that's sort of what led me along the path and, and to, um, <laughs> to fill so many shelf, shelf spaces. Um, because we uh-huh. said, oh, this is fun and this is neat and let's get this because this has got fun stories in it, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So I have a little game we're going to play here. Okay. Before I get to my my uh, my wrap up questions. I know that you are a, a player and keeper in your own right uh, for mm-hmm. all of Cthulhu. Yes. And so for our audience who might not know you, I will ask you, if Charles Ryan was a Call of Cthulhu investigator, what is his occupation? Oh, no. Well, let's say probably either a journalist or a soldier or, you know, an ex-soldier. I, across the board, I lean toward um, roguish characters uh, fin- or finesse fighters. So mm. I think that probably is true. So let me think about some of the games I've played. Um, I had a character who was a gangster that I played in a very long-running campaign uh, run by John Ratliff. Um, so that kind of fits into that a little bit. I did have a character that was an actor that was a lot of fun. I actually had and another character that was a director. And that was a lot of fun, too. So, yeah, something in that, something in those those lines. Okay. Okay. So follow-ups to this are, what do you figure hit your highest skill would be if we're thinking about the the Call of Cthulhu percentage trees of skills? Where's, where's, your, where's your highest skill at? Uh, I'm tempted to put it in credit rating just to make my life easier, but that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's going to be in perception or, or you know, spot hidden, spot I hidden. guess, in, in, uh, nice. in the Cthulhu method. Sorry, I've actually been running um, Masks of Neil Arthitap in Cypher. So I've got the the, the box set. So I'm I'm out of the, the, the uh, Call of Cthulhu skill tree mindset right now. But uh, that's okay. Yeah, probably spot, spot hidden or or, you know, sneaking, that sort of thing. Yeah, spot hidden that um, sort of a double edged skill For there. Sure. It's, it's, it's do you really want to see that? Are you right, sure? Yeah, yeah. So the famous last words in Call of Cthulhu: I, I raise my lantern to take a closer look. <laughs> Are you sure you want to make that listen roll a positive? Right. That's uh, something that my my players that I play with either in, in mass or in horror on the Orange Express are have learned over time, which is. I don't really know that I want to push this role. Right. I think I might just want to fail. It's okay, right? (laughs) Right. You might want to. Okay, so I like to I like to look ahead. I'm sure you as a planner also look ahead. So um given the air date of this, Mm -hmm. what what um obviously as we know, as we've spoken internally here, there will be a Kickstarter. It will likely be over Mm -hmm. by the time this this airs. So um I guess for the benefit of the audience, if they haven't heard about it, what is that Kickstarter? So the this is a it'll actually be on Backer Kit. Okay, cool. Yep. So it'll be on Backer Kit, um, but it will be a uh, or it will have been right a um, uh, cipher system oriented campaign. So for people like yourself who are existing players, know the system and whatnot, it's uh, the thing that will really hook you will be the. Um, a couple of new um, uh, of the white books, the genre books, the big hefty books. Yep. Well, one's post-apocalyptic, one is uh, modern magic. Um, we will, um, un- unfortunately at this stage, I'm not going to say it out loud, but we certainly hope to have unlocked a couple of other titles um, as stretch goals along the way. So there'll be more more than, th- than that. So that's that's for that part of the audience. The other part of the aud- potential audience for this campaign is, is there'll be a new starter set. Oh. And other new things help get people into the cipher system. Um, and we're really... Uh, building this campaign or will have built by the time mm-hmm. your listeners are hearing it, we will have a, a lot of stuff that will help people get into the cipher system and a lot of stuff that will have hopefully drawn in a lot of new players into the, into the system. Oh, good. Yeah, I know that um, you and I had a chance to speak at Gamehole Con recently mm-hmm. and probably would be safe for me to say we'll be going as a show to Gamehole Con. Excellent. So we'll get a chance to hang out sort of as a show, bring some of our players Hopefully uh, have our own space there in some regard. Nice. Maybe do some uh, some live play. For our listeners uh, who are going to go to Origins, we'll also be there. Cool, cool. We have some. Uh, we have a Q and A event and then a live recording event at Origins as well. So we have a lot of stuff we're doing in 2023. 
Well, let me, um, before we, before we sign off, I'll mention two other things that might be of interest Please. to the listeners, um, because you'll fall right between two of our really big, exciting releases of the year. Um, one of them is, uh, stealing stories for the devil, which is a, uh, zero prep improv sci-fi heist game. Mm. And that will have been out about a month, but, uh, by the time that which people are uh, hearing this, so they can check it out at the MCG website or hope they're finally a local game store. And, uh, then we will be probably two months uh, from the release of Old Gods of Appalachia, which is really looking like it's going to be an awesome game. Standalone game based on the podcast, uh, um, based on the Cypher system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got several friends that uh, that decided to back. Uh, it, it was obviously a fantastic um, crowdfunding that was done for that. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that they'll be very interested to get their hands on it once it's all uh, set and ready. Okay. Well, extend well, our thanks to them for helping make it real. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I want to thank you for your time tonight. And uh, hopefully we have um, hopefully we've got, we have some Cypher stuff on the show soon. It's uh, 2023 is going to be a, a, a year of flexibility for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'd love to play some uh, some Cypher system on the show. I have, a, I have a couple of ideas. I can see right here between my two monitors. I can see just staring at me on the shelf are um, Stay Alive. Thanks. And uh, we're all mad here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I use both those books quite a bit because Stay Alive, the horror book, uh, obviously fantastic, uh, particularly if you're running Masks and Neil Arthur Tep in uh, Cypher <laughs> <laughs> or really any, because I, I love horror stuff. I wrote the, the Taking to the Horror Adventure that we ran at our cons this year. Um, I just, uh, horror gaming is probably my, my favorite. Um, and then we played the heck out of We Were All Mad Here. I really have enjoyed that. Uh, Tammy has run a bunch of that and uh, have, have really enjoyed it. All right. Well, thank you again. And uh, I look forward to seeing you out there. Yes, indeed. Great to see you. Uh, and great talking to you. I guess last we spoke, as you said, at, at Gamehole Con. And then I, I, prior to that, it was like, I don't know, two years or something stupid. Yeah, the the business of losing a few years because of a pandemic. That, <laughs> right. that'll, that'll hamper uh, travel and whatnot. But uh, uh, hopefully in 2023, we'll have a little bit of a safer environment to operate in. And um, I'll see you much more. Indeed. Indeed. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Thank you.